Hello folks, this is Sean Wilsey, geology professor, putting together another update on the volcanic unrest in Iceland. Today is November 13th. It's a little after noon here, Mountain Standard Time, which means it's a little after 7 p.m. there in Iceland. What I'd like to do with this update is um, bring you up to speed on some of the data, what's been happening over the last 24 hours or so since my last update. Then we'll turn our attention to, I want to do a brief little tectonic overview, maybe provide some background for those of you that might be a little bit new to Iceland's geology and its unique position in the North Atlantic. And then we'll wrap up with me addressing some questions. There was quite a few questions that have popped up from time to time on some of the comments from some of the previous video updates. And so I wanna maybe address as many of those as I can, probably not get to all of them, but a couple of the really common ones that seem to be coming up. So I wanna thank everyone for their support and encouragement. It seems to be uh, helpful to a lot of you, and that's great. I, I really do pride myself on being a good communicator of science and in being able to uh, take science and the technical data and then distill it such that it's very understandable and something you can wrap your head around. So I appreciate your time and I have tried to answer a lot of the comments on a lot of the videos. I've tried to address a lot of those so please know that I do try to look at those and if for some reason I haven't addressed your question um, let me know and I'll try to get back to that. So, so let's start by looking at our view here of Iceland and if you've been unaware uh, just to bring you up to speed, since late October, we've had a swarm of earthquakes in this part of the Reykjanes Peninsula, southwest of Reykjavik, um, and south, I suppose, or southeast of the Keflavik airport. And we've especially had this become a newsworthy item because the volcanic situation, now we don't have an eruption yet, but the seismic activity, we've had strong earthquakes, there's been ground deformation, and all the signs are pointing to a likely eruption uh, that we're expecting more or less any day now. And the biggest um, reason this has been in the news, it's it's potentially causing quite an impact to Grindavik, which has been evacuated. So this small town of about 4,000 or so people has been evacuated for the time being uh, due to the volcanic unrest. So this is the area that we're looking at. Um, we talked last time about this area here. So this is where we think the intrusion of magma lies more or less in this zone here. It's about 15 kilometers long, about nine miles in length. Um, and the seismic data has definitely confirmed the presence of that. Um, let's look at some new information though now that's that's come down. We just have a, a uh, let me get the right screen open here. We do have a new um, update from the Icelandic Met Office. So let's look at that. First of all, this is a nice little YouTube channel. If you want to get the webcams, uh, several webcams that are fixated in the area of interest kind of going at once along with a, a, a feed from the seismic data, this live from Iceland uh, site is a good one or YouTube channel is a good one to look to for that. Uh, the seismic data, this is over the last 12 hours looking at the earthquakes. Uh, Grindavik is down here. Um, the airport's kind of off the screen up to the left, and then Reykjavik is um, off the screen up to the right. But you can see the real clear northeast-southwest alignment of earthquakes, which nicely delineates the, uh, the magma intrusion. These earthquakes, again, have been quite small compared to what we saw last Friday and Saturday. So if I go for magnitude three and above earthquakes, notice they disappear. Even if we go for twos, we only get a couple in the last 12 hours. So the earthquake activity has dropped off considerably and that's interpreted to mean that the magma is no longer forcing its way into a new section or a new region. When we saw that on Friday and Saturday, that was the magma moving from the Blue Lagoon area over to the east and then probably taking advantage of an older pre-existing set of you know fractures in an older fissure system uh, the Sundu, Sundukur uh, f uh, crater row is up in that area and so it's probably taking advantage of that and potentially even lengthening in it a little bit as well because we see these earthquakes come down into town and go off into the into the ocean here where we previously didn't have any sort of surface um, alignment of craters in that area. So we're seeing it reoccupying 
a known and previous volcanic zone, but potentially lengthening it as well, which is pretty interesting and noteworthy. So let's look at the latest Met update. Uh, and this is from um, today, I think. Let's see, yeah, updated November 13th. Uh, at 420 local time. So seismicity continues, uh, but the size and intensity has decreased. Okay, we discussed that. Uh, about 900 earthquakes since, um, I guess that would be uh, last night, midnight. So a lot of earthquakes still happening. They're just smaller and not nearly as high magnitudes as what we saw before. Uh, and then what they're saying is that the intrusion still is at a few kilometers in depth. Um, and then this is the latest INSAR image that shows some of the ground deformation. These are a little bit tricky to read, these interferograms. Uh, I won't get into the, the nitty gritty here. You sort of count the, the number of colors. So like here's a blue band, here's a blue band. And then that you can use that based on the, uh, the wavelength to figure out how much ground deformation is going on. But you can see where these bands get much tighter in and around this region. Here's uh, Grindavik here. Here's more or less where the intrusion we think would be and so you can see how densely those uh, those bands are that indicates um, the ground deforming. So it's another just way of, of looking into the subsurface or trying to figure out what's happening into the subsurface. And this covers a period. The way this works is it's radar based and it covers a period. So they go over it once with the satellite on November 3rd. Then they go over it again on November 11th. And this is measuring the ground change, the change in ground elevation during that period of time. Um, this sort of just discusses what I just kind of did there. Again, the, the, the magma intrusion or the dike is about 15 kilometers long and it's as close as maybe a kilometer. They were saying earlier about 800 meters, but it's very close to the surface geologically. Um, and then let's see, anything else um, here? Yeah, they're going to do some more modeling later to try to estimate how much magma is actually flowing into the area. So. That's pretty much the update we have from the Met office. Um, in other news related to the event, uh, apparently either today or maybe last night, there were residents were actually allowed to go back in to Grindavik and gather items, pets, anything they'd left behind. So that's great that they were able to get back to their homes. I did hear from one uh, viewer who, who confirmed that, that she was able to go back to her house and get some belongings, but it was also quite bittersweet and sad because you know she she wanted to stay there and not have to leave again. Um, but knowing that they had to leave again as part of the precautionary measures there, um, so that's that's the status of things so far. We're sort sort of in the I don't know if you'd call it the calm before the storm or you know the you know the the quiet period. And again, this is I think the hardest part for us as humans to deal with is um, you know just being patient and letting this volcanic episode play out, um, which can take, again, days, possibly weeks. Um, we don't think it'll take that long. I'd expect something, something's gonna happen, it's probably gonna happen this week, but again, I just, just a hunch, um, sooner rather than later. And then if nothing does happen, that will be a real interesting crossroads as well, is if we don't have any sort of um, indication that the magma is moving anymore and the earthquakes are still dying down, you know, that's where the public officials have to make the tough call of, okay, do we let people go back into their homes knowing that there's this potential? Um, it's it's a double-edged sword, right? Because if you keep people away from their homes and they're evacuated for a long time, that's a no-win situation to some degree. If you let them go back into their homes and then something does happen and heaven forbid people are at risk or their lives are jeopardized, that's also a no-win situation. And so it's just a really tricky situation. Um, I know the Icelandic people will make the right call. I know they'll be understanding. Um, they'll pull together. I, I, this, is, this is the best country for this kind of thing to happen in because these, these people um, are pretty dialed, I think, when it comes to just dealing with life events like these. Um, so anyway, uh, let me just share with you a little bit of what I put together here um, as just a simple uh, overview of Iceland geology. I actually have a much, I have a lot of Icelandic videos on my YouTube channel that I've done from the country about different volcanic features landforms. So if you're interested in Icelandic geology, that's a good place to go. But I do have one specific video and I'll, I'll put it in the link on this video description here um, that gives more of an overview 
of Iceland's geology. And, and I mainly did that I was as I was preparing to take a small group this last May uh, to the country. I, I wanted them to have a little bit of knowledge going in so that that experience would be a little bit better. But if you looked at Iceland from a uh, satellite from above and drew the plate boundary, I think most people know that it sits on a divergent plate boundary, a place where the two plates are spreading apart so that we have the Eurasian plate to the east, the North American plate to the west, and these two plates are pulling apart. And as they pull apart, that thins the Earth cr Earth's crust. As the Earth's crust gets thinner, that allows other material below the Earth's crust to to, the pressure is reduced on it and so it triggers the, the melting and the generation of magma and that magma of course then starts to rise towards the surface and so that's why we have so many volcanoes in Iceland but if you just did a very simple uh, map like I did here just kind of took where you thought the here's the plate boundary coming onto the Reykjanes Peninsula here on the southwest coast uh, and then where it exits on the north coast of Iceland. This is where I think most people would draw it somewhere in here. But of course, just like a lot of um, locations, it's not that simple. So if you looked at a more um, detailed tectonic map of Iceland, we can see that it actually has some sort of branches to it. There's there's this clear branch here that extends from Circe, which I talked about in the last video, uh, and Heime. So these had eruptions in the 60s and 70s, uh, up through some of these volcanoes here, um, and then off to the north coast. Then we have this other plate boundary or tectonic boundary here, which controls a lot of volcanoes. And then there's, there's some structures in here, I won't get into the details of these, um, that sort of combine these two but it's much messier than you might think otherwise if we ignore maybe the plate motions which is a little tricky to do because it sort of governs a lot of things but just looked at the volcanic zones uh, notice it gets even messier so here's a diagram and all these numbers on here are different uh, what we call rift zones or volcanic zones in Iceland most of which line up nicely along the plate boundaries that we just looked at, um, but some of which uh, run in different areas here. So we have this little zone over here that's uh, somewhat anomalous. Um, and then you can also see in places like in the central part of Iceland, we have big volcanoes. That's why there's ice caps there is the topography is really high and that keeps a lot of snow and ice. And so we have bigger, more centralized volcanoes in the interior down in the region we're focused on currently, this these areas of volcanoes tend to form more uh, fissure systems or lines of small craters instead of one big uh, large volcano. So you can see how messy it gets here. And you can also see that even though the plate boundary on the Reykjanes Peninsula more or less trends uh, east to west there, that the volcanic zones cut it at a bit of an angle. And here's a little better view of that. This is um, something I grabbed from the, uh, this is a, Icelandic Geothermal Company, and this is one of their uh, images from a presentation. So you can see the Reykjanes volcanic uh, system here, uh, the Erdvjörp one, which is the one near uh, Grindavik, uh, and then this is the one that's been erupting the last three years, Fagradasfjall, um, and then Krusevik, hope I said that right, and then some other ones over here. So, they, so you can see they sort of step over. There's just a system, and then it steps to the east, it steps to the east, so it's what we call an N echelon a series of volcanic systems that actually form that tectonic boundary between those two adjacent plates. Um, and then the other thing I found in this same report, which I found really interesting, was looking at this volcanic region on this peninsula here and looking at the time period when we've seen volcanic eruptions. And so here's more or less those six zones listed across the top. And then what we have here is a time frame for the eruptions. So notice that many of the, these volcanic systems on the peninsula were erupting from about 3,000 to 3,500 years ago. So the yellow bar here represents a volcanic episode or a series of eruptions over a period of time. The red bars are the carbon dates, and so those are our firm fixed uh, age datums that we can kind of hang our hats on. And then you can see another period here from about 18, I guess, 18 to 1900 years ago to about 2500 years ago. Um, and then another one here, the most recent one, well, not the most recent one, but the one that produced a lot of the topography and the landforms we see today occurred from about, um, I don't know, about 1200 
years ago up to maybe like 700 years ago. But notice that each one of these um, was followed by a period of volcanic quiescence, so a quiet period where we didn't see a lot of eruptions. Uh, and then what they plotted up here is the most recent period of eruptions that started in 2021 in this region. And what we're seeing today happening right now at the end of 2023 is just the latest iteration of that. And so um, usually we don't see this kind of, and it's not a perfect cycle, but um, semi-cyclicity in volcanic systems. And it's based on limited data, right? You're only looking at three data points for any given volcanic system. Um, but it's interesting. It's an interesting comparison. It's an interesting to kind of look at. And, and the question I suppose would be, is are we headed into starting in 2021 and continuing to today, are we heading into a period of volcanic activity, heightened volcanic activity and unrest in this part of Iceland that could go on for several hundred years? And of course, no one will know. We won't know until we get there. Um, but I think based on past events, that's a very high likelihood. So pretty interesting stuff. Um, let me then conclude because I don't want to spend too much time. Uh, I want to keep these updates as, as concise as possible. This one might run a little bit longer just based on some of the things I've got planned here. But I do appreciate you taking time and spending it with me here. So let me try to address a couple of questions that have come up uh, on comments and, and different forums and chats. And I feel like there's just a lot of there's a lot of information flowing out there. And there's also a lot of hype, hyperbole, uh, doomsday type of things going on and so hopefully I can maybe provide a little bit of uh, levity here and a little bit of perspective. Uh, take it for what it's worth. If you don't like what I say that's fine. You can you can choose to find whatever uh, sort of train of thought best suits your needs. So the first question that, that has come up with a lot of folks people traveling there or people maybe that have plans there is it safe to travel to Iceland and the answer is it, right now of course it is. Um, remember that we're only looking at a possible volcanic event affecting a very small part of the overall country. Uh, and while it's definitely a, a huge stressful issue for the residents of this community, and we have these three roadways closed, so some of the attractions and places you might visit on a trip to Iceland are not accessible. Um, the rest of the country is open for tourism and visitors, and and I think you should go unless anything, unless something changes. Uh, the airport should be okay. Um, it's similar to, you know, like if you were flying into Miami and you'd seen that there was a hurricane in the Atlantic Ocean, you might keep an eye on that hurricane as you make your travel plans and as your travel date approaches. I would, I would approach a trip to Iceland the same way. I would keep to my travel plans as they're constituted, but I would check the news every, you know, maybe every day, once every day, just to make sure nothing's happened because um, really the only thing that could happen here that might jeopardize the airport would be if we had an eruption in the water and we had enough ash being produced and the wind uh, carrying that ash towards the airport that that might, um, you know, affect air, tra air traffic to some degree. So uh, another question that's often come up is the thought or um, concern about a tsunami being generated. And basically, no, we're not going to see a tsunami generated with any type of eruption here. Obviously, if the eruption is on land, which it's very likely to be, whether it's uh, in and close to Grindavik or if it's further up in the fissure system here uh, to the north, uh, neither one of those events would produce a tsunami. If we did have an eruption here at the south west end of the magma intrusion in the ocean, that would still probably not displace enough water to produce a tsunami. Would it cause a little bit bigger waves locally? Probably, but it would it produce a tsunami, uh, what we call a basin-wide tsunami, a tsunami that would actually be large enough that it would extend across other reaches of the Atlantic and impact other shorelines? And the answer to that is no, this would not be that type of event. Um, so. Hopefully that helps a little bit. Uh, similar question to that would be coastal collapse. Um, now we do see this in places in Hawaii and in the Canary Islands. There's evidence that in the past there's been catastrophic collapses of those island or parts of the island into the ocean that presumably also produced uh, a large tsunami. Uh, and as far as I know, there's no evidence of that around Iceland. We don't see anything in the bathymetry, even stuff like this down here. These are 
um, more like little small landslides coming off this continental sh this shelf here um, into the water. So we don't have any evidence for that happening anywhere in Iceland, and I think that's a hard no on that being uh, any bit of a concern. Um, how about uh, this eruption affecting the climate? Nope. Um, locally here around Iceland, you might have, if, again, if it's an eruption in the ocean, you might have some um, vog, if you're familiar with that term, volcanic fog. You might have some air quality diminished a little bit, but Iceland has strong winds. Um, that material would quickly dissipate. And again, it's not that big of an eruption um, at this point to really have concerns about that. Um, other folks have asked, like, and this is, you know, some have asked in a more sensitive way and some have asked in a more callous way about, well, hey, didn't they know when they put these communities in place, didn't they know they were building on top of volcanoes? And I mean, that's, I don't know really how to address that other than if humans avoided all natural hazards when they settled areas, there'd be very few places for us to live, right? You know, people in Kansas and Tornado Alley, people along the coastline in the southeast where there's hurricanes, people in Southern California where there's fault systems in New Zealand. There's, you know, the entire island of Iceland is built on volcanic rock. Um, some of it quite old, some of it more recent. Um, and so I, I think playing that game is, is just a little silly. Um, you know, certainly this area hadn't had eruptions for hundreds of years. Um, and so, yeah, I'm not going to, I'm really not going to go too far into that. Um, so the type of eruption we'd expect to see, if you've looked at some of the things that have happened in Hawaii or the recent eruptions in Iceland, that's what we expect to see. The reason that this eruption is a little bit more of a big deal. So we had eruptions here in 2021 and 2023, and they were a visual spectacle. It was a tourist attraction. It was a great place for people to park their cars along the road, hike in, and marvel at nature's fireworks show. Um, and I did that in 2022. It was, it was awesome. And the reason this wasn't a, a hazard in any way, shape, or form was there wasn't any infrastructure nearby. There's no farms. It didn't get down to the road. It didn't uh, threaten any people's lives or livelihoods. And so uh, it was kind of off the radar. This is a totally different situation where we have uh, a large, well, not a large, well, a town of certain size here, uh, a port, a fishing community that's at risk along with other pieces of infrastructure like the power plant. And so that's why this is a very much a bigger deal. So while this was became a tourist attraction when we had the eruption over here to the east, um, this is gonna still, if, if and when the eruption takes place, this area is gonna be largely off limits. They've already closed the roadways, the town's evacuated. They've even put in a no fly zone for drones. There's obviously a lot of people that wanna go see, be there and see if something happens. And I'm one of them, like I'd love to be boots on the ground nearby and get to witness the you know, uh, initiation of a volcanic eruption. Uh, but it's just too hazardous of a situation right now. And so I'd ask anyone who's considering that to just um, please abide by the Icelandic authorities and let them uh, make that call here. And let's all be sensitive to the people uh, that are in that community as well. So so we're not expecting a big explosive event like the 2010 uh, IFF eruption off to the east. That was under a glacier. That's why that one became... Uh, very explosive and shut down air traffic in Europe for a period of time. This one's going to be a much smaller than that. So um, there was also real quick here uh, a question about potentially uh, putting in some sort of uh, either drilling into the subsurface or even maybe detonating the right type of bomb that might um, relieve some of the pressure in the volcanic system. Um, and, you know, in theory, it sounds like kind of it might work, right? If you think about this magma as being under pressure, if you can just like somehow put a hole in it and relieve that pressure or control where the lava and the eruption takes place, you know, it seems to make sense. The problem with that is, is, is on multiple levels. One, it's never been done. There's no way to know if it would actually work, could actually make the eruption worse, potentially. That's a possibility. Um, I think it's largely like sticking a pinhole in a hot air balloon where you drill a hole. Like how big would your hole be? Let's say you put a, a two, let's say it's a meter across, like a one meter hole down into where this magma intrusion is. Um, 
that's not that's not a very large pressure release um, zone given the amount of magma in the entire system um, and then there's all sorts of things like cultural and ethical considerations um, you know it, 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 they'd have to vote on it it would take months and possibly weeks of public and civic discourse before they would even like decide to do that and so um, while it, it's a fun little thought experiment probably not super practical so um, and then lastly a question that's come up is well what if there's no eruption at all what if there's not an eruption uh, within the next couple days or, or weeks um, and that's a tricky one because you know like what at what point do you let people move back in kind of mentioned that before um, but eventually even if we don't see something with this eruptive period over the next few weeks to a few months or so um, I think given the eruptions that we've seen over here um, with the last three eruptions in in this area over here um, whoops that one's not yet potentially um, that there's you know we're likely to see more eruptions in this region right it's going forward this this system is not done erupting within the next few years and so that's something to maybe think about there so hopefully i've given you some helpful information here maybe dispelled a few myths or fears that are circulating out there uh, giving you the data as best i can it's a little harder to hunt for it um, when you're not familiar with the language and how where that information is stored but I'm doing the best I can likely I, I missed a few things but again hopefully this is a little bit helpful appreciate you watching and I will get back on as soon as there's uh, something I'd like to share or if in, if the situation changes uh, in a large degree so thanks so much and have a great day